Uh, Malcolm, you're welcome back too on the stage. Our three guests for your questions. Please come in queue if you have questions for them. This is our last segment before the morning tea break. Uh, so please make use of these three experienced people here on stage to answer your questions. Again, please come. I'll just bring that microphone across. Please come and queue up at either of the microphones as we welcome back David Carley, uh, Chelsea Sexton, and uh, Malcolm is back with us as well. No questions. Don't be shy. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, Andy Foster, I, what's this thing on? Yes. Yeah, it is. Okay, Andy Foster, I'm a city councillor here, I chair our Transport and Urban Development Committee. Uh, what I wanted to ask you about is, the, is to expand a little bit on electric buses, the availability of electric buses and how close they are to being a reality and to being an effective reality. Obviously, as some of you will know, we've, got a, we've had a debate about removing uh, the current electric buses, which are trolley bus powered, and moving to something else, and uh, many of us would very much like that to be an electric bus system. So keen to hear a little bit more about what you think that the opportunities might be there and how far they are away in terms of being effective. Right, so um, it's interesting because if you go to something like BYD in China, um, they have huge fleets of electric buses now, like, re you know, hundreds, well, probably tens of thousands of buses, electric buses now operational. Uh, in the European context, it's been a bit slower. I think what uh, the challenge has been is how do you deal with the charging because you, you need large amounts of energy to, to shunt around. And I think they, they're probably about five years behind in terms of <coughs> deployment. Uh, we're starting to see the first uh, generation of electric buses coming out now. Uh, and I reckon in about two to three years' time, you'll start to see mass rollout of, of electric buses of various descriptions. I think what's interesting is to see how do you actually deal with the, t the, 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 the charging one. And the way that BYD does it is they basically do battery replacement. Now, normally battery replacement for conventional vehicles is a really dumb idea because uh, for every battery that you, that you have on a vehicle, you need another two batteries in the system. So you've got about three batteries for every vehicle. Now, when you go for uh, buses where you have fixed schedules, you know exactly what your fleet are doing, you can schedule when you're doing the batteries and everything, you bring that down to, to two. And actually, it doesn't really make a huge difference because um, you basically double the life of those batteries because they're going through that, that routine. So that uh, battery charging, uh, sort of that, that battery changeover works really well in, in buses, in, in bus fleets. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, I've had, had these views beforehand is that um, I think having the trolley, the lines, you will regret not having them in five years' time as a number of cities are starting to put in trolley lines to deal with the, with the system. So I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. I, I recognize the age of them and that they're, I mean, I, I, I was completely gobsmacked to find that you guys are still using mercury arc rectifiers. I mean, I remember seeing mercury arc rectifiers when I was a nipper. That, that was a long time ago, and I thought that they disappeared completely from the world, but no, they're still running strong here. So, so I recognize that there's a huge amount of investment to go through, but I do think that um, it's an investment that may well come back. So um, it, it's, it's, I would just say, you know, think carefully before you make any strong decisions on that because the technologies are coming through, and they're coming through fast. Thank you, Councillor Andy uh, Foster. Just if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, and we'll just alternate between the two sides. Sue. So. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Smith from Consumer New Zealand. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on um, plug-in electric vehicles and um, whether you, you know, I have this feeling that they're a bit of a comfort blanket um, of the electric vehicle world, um, given the range. Um, but uh, yeah, I wondered if you, um, if you thought they were, they, what their future was um, in sort of easing the transition of people into, into electric vehicles. I think plug-in hybrids are sort of a that comfort blanket for people who aren't really educated on on how far they can actually go a battery electric. Like as as I said, like ninety seven or ninety five percent of of daily driving can be done with a an existing electric vehicle that's in market today. Um, 
the I think plug-in hybrids are good for maybe taxis, right? That are doing I don't know thousand kilometers a you know a day type of thing. Um, but all that's going to change. You know, when we look at the new wave of electric vehicles that are coming out with um, three, four, five hundred kilometers uh, of range that can be done in a day, uh, I think they're a stopgap that I don't think you'll see in the years to come. I have a slightly less judgmental point of view about them. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest and hardest step to get anyone to take is to adopt a plug in the first place. Once they do, they tend to want more and more electrification over time. So if a plug-in hybrid is that first step in, I'm fine with that. There's also single-car households in a variety of different constituents that may never graduate from a plug-in hybrid, and that's okay too. It's worth recognizing that there's a range in plug-in hybrids. I mean, everything from a 15-kilometer plug-in Prius to a 75-kilometer Chevrolet Volt, and that they're not all created equally. But in the case of the latter, the data is already showing that 90% or more of trips are electric. So we get really precious around a gallon or two of petrol here and there. But if you have somebody that psychologically or realistically cannot use a 100 or 150 kilometer electric car, and even when we get to two, three, 400, there will still be range anxiety. It is naive to think the Model 3 is going to change that overnight there's a place for plug-in hybrids. And the more variety we can offer, the better. Plug-in hybrids also enable larger vehicles that would be prohibitively expensive as battery electric only, SUVs and trucks and utes and things that people want also. So yes, things will gel around a couple <coughs> specific flavors probably. Ranges of plug-in hybrids will probably increase to a relative sweet spot of most trips, but not all trips. But it, to, to eliminate anything at this point, is counterproductive. Judith. Uh, Judith Aitken, I'm a, a Wellington Regional Councillor. Just in terms of the motivations um, of, of um, and therefore demand, I'm interested in whether there's any um, of the psychological and emotional factors that are gender or age specific. Mm -hmm. So actually this, the study that we did that uh, I got permission to share, so we'll, I'll be sharing that uh, locally here, um, found three uh, types of target audiences. The first was environmentalist, which I, I can't remember the statistics, but I do have it in the study. And that was heavily weighted towards uh, female. The second was what we consider technologist, which is somebody who appreciates the technical ad advantages and, and um, characteristics of that, and that was predominantly actually 55% male. And then the third was uh, what we called low tech or low environment or sometimes cost conscious, and that didn't really have a gender association with it. Um, that's some of the information I had. Uh, I don't think, I think there was some age information in there. Um, I think we're finding that it is in sort of the older category, uh, the, because they're a more expensive vehicle, they generally have to have someone who has a high disposable income. And that's typically you know, in a more senior position. Um, actually, one of the things we're seeing in Vancouver a lot of is car sharing. So um, there's organizations that basically you can just walk up to a, a one of these car shares, put a, a a dongle or what have you on it and just drive away with the car and then when you finish with it you just dump it wherever you want and walk on your way. And it was interesting, Mercedes-Benz um, implemented this in Vancouver because they found they could get more revenue out of sharing a car than selling it to somebody. And a lot of these now, there are now, a lot of them are hybrids and now some of them are now looking to fully electrify some of those car shares. So that's another strategy because it reduces the number of cars that people have to own, reduces the number of cars on the road. Um, another interesting statistic was that I saw was Uber Pool. So I don't know if you have, do you have Uber here and, right? So Uber Pool sort of says, hey, if somebody's going from Waikanae to Wellington, but there's also someone who wants to go from Paparam to, to Wellington, why don't we use that same vehicle to pick up the person in Pap Ram and those two people can kind of share the cost. 
and they've actually got statistics that actually show how many how much carbon they've reduced by doing that and the number of cars on the road and it's separate but it's uh, another statistics that we're seeing yeah, I'd say put differently, the, the market for electric vehicles originally looked a lot like the people in this room, demographically. And as prices have come down, it has started to skew younger and more towards women. It is somewhat um, dependent on the, the style. So I'm an, I'm an anomaly. I like torque and horsepower more than anyone rightfully should. But generally, the more performance-oriented characteristics skew more male. The more familial-oriented characteristics skew more female. You know, I talk to, to moms who say driving an electric car means another hour with my young children at night. That's their emotional experience versus I can take a Ferrari off the line, which would be mine. <laughs> so it is changing a little bit as variety changes. As we've started to see more larger vehicles, uh, the Model X, uh, the appetite, at least in the US, for the Mitsubishi Outlander, which we're still waiting for, that also skews more female, and more SUV oriented. So it varies a little bit with the model availability as well. And variety will only help that diversity grow. Hi, I'm um, Laura Leischmidt from Opus International Consultants. Um, I was just wondering, you had mentioned the maintenance cost being a lot lower for EVs, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Um, what makes the cars kind of reach the end of the line, if that's just batteries and if they could actually just be replaced? And if there is still that issue that people always were talking to me about maybe six years ago, about um, the batteries being really, really bad for the environment and actually EVs aren't even that good for the environment because of the battery disposal issue. So I'll take the cost one, but I, I want to let Malcolm dive into the battery because that's his, uh, it's definitely his expertise area. Um, so I think when you look at a tr traditional uh, gasoline or you know, petrol based vehicle, you're obviously paying an enormous amount more for um, gasoline. I think I did a study and petrol would have to get to 17 cents a litre to be on par with, with electricity, right? That's not gonna happen anytime soon, is it? Um, the other thing is oil changes. I don't do oil changes in my car. Transmission flushes, doesn't happen. Brakes, I don't use as many brakes. And not many people know this, right? But is that, is a, it's called regenerative braking. So when you take your foot off the gas in a petrol car, you're still idling and you're consuming a small amount and the energy that you're burning when you go down the hill is, is heat in your brakes. When I go down a hill, what it does is it, without getting too technical, it uses the motor to charge the battery. I've actually started at the top of a hill with less charge or less range than at the bottom. I've gained like five or six kilometers by the time I get to the bottom and I'm not using my brakes. So there's another cost that, that you don't have to pay, right? So from a cost perspective, it's incredible the amount of money that, that you can save. Okay. So on batteries, it's kind of interesting. There's uh, a sea change happening there as well. So uh, one thing is, is that you can recycle about 95% of the lithium. So that, that's a major change. Uh, and you can also, the, the, the rest of the stuff tends to be very inert. It's almost like um, gravel. The, that comes out of it extremely inert, no toxins there at all. But what's been interesting is that there's a lot of work that's going on, and this is part of the project, where actually you can second life a lot of the batteries. Because what you find in a, typically in a pack for, uh, you might have 12 cells in a, in a group, in a string. Maybe only one of those cells is really causing problems, and the rest of the 11 are, are still perfectly good. And we've developed some technology where we can actually get about uh, twice the life again out of, this, out of the same cells. And we're actually busy deploying them out in Kenya in rural uh, rural systems. So we, we think there's a great life for, ahead for um, second lifing of, of, of batteries. So. Well, and, and to add one step further onto that, one of the interesting implications with respect to second life is that there is really very little assumption that batteries will only have one life in a car. I mean, it's almost absolutely assumed it's gonna come out of a car, go into the grid or your basement or whatever. And the economics of that become really interesting because, for example, if General Motors knew that you know, North Power would buy X kilowatt hours of their used Volt or Bolt batteries, they can lower the price of the car up front and spread that cost over two or three uses before those batteries are finally recycled. Mm -hmm. So the, the implications and the opportunity are vast. I, I think 
I know on the Nissan Leaf, the, guar the battery is guaranteed for eight years. So you will not see any degradation in... Oh, yeah, you'll see degradation. But it's <laughs> guaranteed for, what is it, like 75%? Five years. Right. Yeah. So you know, the, the life of that battery for a for typical person owning a vehicle is, is you're not going to be wildly impacted. Hi, um, I'm John Hancock. I'm from the Smart Grid Forum, actually, and this is fascinating because this is a completely different group of people we normally get when we do stuff about EVs. So there's a <laughs> <laughs> really, really quite, uh, really, actually, before, I've got a jokey observation before I ask my incredibly intelligent question. I don't know whether you guys realize this in the room, but the way they've laid this out, the presenters are all on a little dais, and we all have to come and queue up and ask. Our, it's like you're asking for absolution. So you come and, uh, you know, sort of get... Uh, get us. Anyway, my, my question. Um, <laughs> so, Malcolm, you made a point about uh, benefits in terms of things that people really value, and you were talking about time. So I think what you were getting at was if there's an incentive where you get to drive in a bus lane, you get to work faster, you get an extra half an hour a day or something... One of the things we've got quite stuck on is the convergence between electric vehicles and self-driving vehicles because it is definitely true that the leading self-driving vehicle manufacturer is also a BEV manufacturer. But a lot of the skeptics would say there's absolutely no reason that a, a combustion vehicle couldn't integrate all of those technologies. And I'm yet to hear anyone really articulate why it is that the move to self-driving vehicles is intrinsically electric because I think if we could articulate that, that's a very powerful message. It's very simple. The skills bases are very similar. So the skills that you need to do electric vehicles um, is very similar to what you need to do um, on the high-end computing side for, for the self-drive vehicle. So the type of people you get involved in electric vehicles tend to be those who are a lot more interested in, in, in the processing side of, of life, whereas most of your, what I would endear them as metal bashers are not particularly interested in, in that side of things. Um, there, there is a slight technical reason as well why um, batteries are slightly better and that is your response times are much quicker in electric vehicles than they are for um, conventional vehicles and that actually does make a difference in the amount of processing you need to do up front. So actually uh, I know of about six leading companies working in, in autonomous vehicles, they're all doing electric because of that particular reason. The response times are just so much quicker. Yeah, and at the same time, though, it's not universal. I mean, certainly Tesla, Nissan, electric and autonomous go together. Germans, not so much. Um, you know, Audi is also one of the leading autonomous companies. The A8 petrol vehicle will be the first to have any sort of level three autonomous in 2018, 2019. Um, and then only later will it come to electric cars. So there is certainly some technological conjoining, brake by wire, steer by wire. None of the systems that were pioneered for EVs are also really useful on autonomous. There's also a market reason. Today's EV customers are tomorrow's autonomous customers, but it is not a foregone conclusion for every manufacturer. They are not codependent, but they are co-enabling. And there's certainly some acceptance by those same automakers that, yes, so inevitably we'll have to go electric. And by the way, in parallel, we're also working on autonomous, and those will converge. But it is not universally accepted that they'll go together. Yeah. Agreed. Thanks. Uh, Paul Bruce, um, Regional Councillor. Uh, I'd like to address a question to Malcolm McCulloch. Um, we have a very successful rail system to the north of the city. Um, I'd like, um, we've been talking about rubber wheels today, and they do emit carcinogenic particles and, and heavy metals, which gets into our, our rivers and our harbours. I wonder what premium would we pay to extend our rail system as light rail through the city from Wellington Railway Station? Uh, okay, so uh, light rail or, um, is a great idea. The challenge is the infrastructure uh, challenge. Um, if you ask Edinburgh, they've just put in a tram system. They've had eight years of complete hell in trying to get around the city while they put their tram system in. Um, they're now enjoying it, but they did go through eight years of hell. And the, the councillors got, the, the guys who made the original decision got booted out because of that. So it, it, it had a political risk associated with it. So it's something that one has to be careful of doing. I think it's, you know, long term it's the right thing to do. Short to medium term, you've got a challenge. Yeah? Actually, so in, in Vancouver we have SkyTrain. So it's, a, so it's an elevated um, 
uh, light rail system. Um, and a lot of the tracks that it runs on are city owned. So there was, uh, and then s we just put in a new line to the, the airport and that was underground. But um, yeah, there was, there was some pain that went through that as well. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, still, it's still quite successful. I think we have, as I said, 117 million riderships a year, and uh, it's quite inexpensive, I find, actually. Like, I think it, for me to do about a 40-minute drive, a 40-minute uh, trip on it, it's like, like four or five bucks. Yeah. So it's quite, quite effective. Hi there, Paul Young. I'm a researcher with uh, an NGO called the Morgan Foundation. Um, my question is, um, you, you know, all of you might... Uh, already know this, but just to clarify, we um, the gov government policy is for we have a road user charge um, exemption for EVs, which is guaranteed to uh, until a, a EVs make up two percent of the light vehicle fleet, which which if targets are met is around five years time, could be longer if they're not met, um, and that's that equates to around about six hundred dollars a year. So so my question is, what would be more effective out of that? versus having, that, say, the same qu qu um, quantity of money, $3,000, $4,000, brought up front into a direct rebate on purchase? <clears throat> Personally, I'd go for the rebate, but I understand the anti-subsidy sentiment. So, <laughs> so I know the realities of that, but psychologically, the money up front is helpful. Also, the vast majority of people who are buying a car are not paying cash for it. They're financing it. So the, uh, the rebate up front helps lower the monthly payment, helps lower the cost loss to financing. It creates it more affordable for sort of average families, which is important for financial subsidies at all. Yeah, Andrew McBeth from the Greater Wellington Regional Council. I'm interested in some sort of public policy issues and incentivizing electric vehicles. Uh, and in the context of private motor vehicles, whether they are petrol or electric, and their impacts that they have on, on a wider society. So I'm talking about uh, motor vehicle crashes and I'm talking about um, uh, urban sprawl. And those are issues that are uh, exacerbated by private motorised vehicles and, and congestion, of course, and then parking, I guess, is a big one as well, the cost of, of parking. So where should, uh, you know, all three of you, I think, have, have um, talked about the benefits of and the need for public funding in terms of incentivising. Why should the taxpayer at large fund that expansion rather than, say, the existing motor vehicle industry? You know, is, is there some way of differentiating so that um, petrol cars pay more and, and electric cars pay less, but you don't, you don't um, incentivise the motorisation of society. So let me pick up that to start off with. Well, you guys have a chance to think. Um, so the, the, what you're actually going down to is the heart of mobility. You know, wh why do we have mobility? What is it for? How do we do it? And I think it's a space that is going to be changing quite dramatically over the next 15 years or so, but it's going to be a slow change in the next five. The challenge that we have is that the, we've just grown up with, all of us have grown up with the, almost feels like we've got the divine right to be able to climb in a vehicle and go where we want to. And to move away from that, it feels like it's challenging to do, you know, it's going to be really challenging to, to move away from it. I think that... As you, we, we are experiencing with the younger generation, though, is that the idea of having access to mobility is becoming far more important than actually having vehicles. So what you'll find is that if you will improve the public transport and you have um, cycle networks and those types of things as well, and you have your Ubers or, or, or sort of like demand type of uh, mobility services that are coming through, what you'll find is that um, desperate drive to have more vehicles will start to, to wane away. But these are much bigger questions that we, we need to work with. So my kind of, the, 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 the short answer is, is that um, vehicles are bad, electric vehicles are slightly less bad. <laughs> <laughs> I would absolutely agree with that. And I think the, the message that we promote um, is, first and foremost, 
um, when you look at your transportation requirements, you look to to leverage public transport or uh, or even some of the other messages that we're doing in Vancouver is is really enabling sort of cycling. So there's dedicated cycling lanes. Um, you know, there's certain laws and and what have you that are coming into place. Um, but I agree with you, Malcolm. I think there's public transit seems hard, right? Like I, I could I could get on the public transit to go downtown Vancouver, but it's going to take me about probably 15 minutes more than if I got in my car and did it myself. Yeah. Um, so I think the other challenge, the other thing that you need to think about, and we've tackled this in, in Vancouver, is setting up satellite hubs, yeah. right? So having, you've got the Greater Wellington region, you don't want everyone commuting in from all the out, outer suburbs into Wellington and then back out again. You're setting up uh, other CBDs, if you will, in the hut, in the Capiti Coast, in, so that people don't have to commute all the way into Wellington, right? Um, really encourage work from home, right, as a strategy, um, so that you don't have to come into the office, that you can work from home, you don't have to get into a vehicle. Those things can be completely outside of whether you choose a, a, an electric vehicle or not. But as Malcolm said, right, if you do absolutely have to pick a vehicle and you do absolutely have to drive somewhere, it's better on all those different levels for it to be, or less bad, yeah. for it to be a, an electric vehicle than it would be to be a gasoline-powered one. Thank you so much. Would you uh, please warm a round of applause and gratitude for Chelsea Sexton, David Carley and also Malcolm McCulloch. Thank you.